Well, it's really uh, good to be here uh, with you again. It was a joy to be with you a couple of weeks ago, and it's lovely uh, to be back amongst you. And again, I bring the uh, prayers and the, uh, uh, and the affections of uh, the church at Ely Presbyterian. We're, uh, and we're very glad to be welcoming uh, John uh, to preach with us uh, next week. We always look forward to, uh, to having him amongst us. And then the following Wednesday, I think he's talking to us about his trip to Nepal. Uh, so uh, we're uh, looking forward to seeing a lot of John over the next uh, week uh, and a half. Well, I didn't know you were um, heading into Hope Explored this evening, so I hope what I have to say this morning might maybe introduce a little bit of what will come up there, because... In this passage in Hebrews 11, I want to look at the subject of living well and dying well, which is something that comes up in verses 13 to 16 of this passage about these people who all died in faith. Now, in 2019, uh, we lost my grandmother. She was 94 years old. And she had cancer at the end, but she was mentally uh, very sharp. And we used to go and visit her in um, the hospice. She was in the uh, Marie Curie Hospice in, in Cardiff. And we, we often we, we went there, and, and when, when we went in to see her, the first thing she'd say to us is, I'm still here. And it was always done with this kind of wry smile on her face, because to be honest, as she said to us on many times, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go and be with my Lord. I want to go and be with Jesus Christ. Because, you know, she had this absolute conviction that she knew where she was going. For most of her life, she'd lived a, a life of faith. You know, she was a, a woman of conviction. Uh, a woman who, who knew who her Savior was. And she was a woman who died in that same way. What she looked for, while she might have been glad to see her family... What her delight was, what her joy was, was to to go and be with her Lord. So, if you like, she lived well and she died well. She lived believing and she died trusting. So the child of God living and dying well is really important. It's it's an important part, actually, of, of what comes up, particularly in the New Testament. But what we also see, particularly in this passage in Hebrews, is that it was something that the Old Testament saints were very interested in as well. You know, we might read, we read it later on as well in this same chapter. So I just want to look at these two points, really. It's dying, dying well first and living well. And the reason I'm looking at dying well first is because that's what comes up first in this, in this passage in verse 13. Now, the order of things seems backwards because we live and, of course, we die. We live first. But here our writer speaks of dying before living. And the point, I believe, is this, that in order to die well, we have to live well. This is what happens with these Old Testament saints. So he's instructing us with the readers of this epistle that we need to live well now in order to die well, to die in faith, to die with confidence, to die with conviction about what is going to happen. And that's the same perspective, if you like, of Abraham, Isaac, Sarah, and Jacob, who are mentioned already in this chapter, doesn't it? It says, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers or aliens and exiles on this earth. And it's these opening words, isn't it, that tells us the end of faith's journey. And what, it is, uh, what is considered by Christians to be dying well. But the other thing it tells us is that faith is a pilgrimage. Faith is a journey that we're on. Sometimes we speak of it as the life of faith. And in this sense, when we come to verses 13 to 16, we're told what the end of that journey looks like or what it's supposed to look like for us. And while we could speak of it in terms of referring to Abel, Enoch, and Noah, which is completely true, These all died in faith. However, the immediate context in thinking about it as a pilgrimage, as a journey, does specifically refer to Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, and Jacob. Because these were the ones who lived as pilgrims in the land of promise. 
And so them living as pilgrims in the land of promise was actually an exercise of their faith. This is, this is just the actual living in this way. And the reason for this is they didn't actually receive what was promised. And in fact, when you think about the story of Abraham, the story of Abraham is astonishing, even from the beginning, as we have it in the Bibles. You see, Abraham, as we know, was called out of Ur of the Chaldeans. Now, I don't know if you know much about Ur, but Ur was a, uh, a very progressed society in those days. Education, excellent. Uh, business, commerce. It was a developed nation in its time. Cities, you know, and the city of Ur was dominated by the ziggurat, which was um, built for the god Ur Namu. Now, despite all it, its progressiveness, all its uh, knowledge in religion and education, it was deeply pagan. And in fact, this religion was uh, very involved with human sacrifice. So that was where, so Abraham lived in that context as a pagan in that context. And amazingly, God broke into that man's life and called him and said, I want you to leave your city, I want you to leave your family, I want you to leave everything you know, I want you to leave your business, and I want you to go into a land that I'll show you. But he didn't tell him where that land was, and he didn't tell him how long he was going to take to get there. And we're told Abraham obeyed. But don't forget, that's just one step with Abraham. The second step actually was Abraham then had to go and tell Sarah. He had to go and tell Sarah and say, right, Sarah, God has come and spoken to me. And God has said, we now have to leave everything that we have here and leave and go to this land. You've got to leave all your, your house, everything and everyone you know, and we need to go to this land. And you think Sarah's first question would be, okay, well, where are we going? And Abraham's answer is, I don't know. Well, how long is it going to take us to get there? Abraham's answer, I don't know. And the amazing thing is, while we read of Abraham's faith, we also have to acknowledge Sarah's amazing faith because she agreed to go. And they packed up everything and they left and they went and they went via Haran. And then when they got to the land, of course, God then also said, well, it's actually not going to be yours. And it's going to be for your descendants, even though you haven't had a child yet. And what you're going to do is for the next hundred years, though Abraham may not have known how long he was going to live, you're going to wander around in a tent. And you're going to... Go here, you're going to live for a bit, then you're going to move and go somewhere else, you're going to live for a bit there, and you're going to wander for a hundred years, and you're never going to receive the land, but it's for your children and your children's children. I mean, in, Steve, in, in uh, Acts chapter 7, Stephen says as much, when he begins his speech to the Sanhedrin just before he's martyred, he speaks about the God of glory appearing to Abraham, and then he says... Then he went out from the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran, and after his father died, God removed him from there into this land in which you're now living, yet he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot's length, but promised to give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him, though he had no child. So, it's astonishing, isn't it, actually, when you think of the faith of Abraham, even in obeying the call that he went, following God's word, trusting in God's promise, to live in this way. And of course, we could say the same about Isaac and Jacob. Isaac spent his entire life, 180 years, wandering. Jacob likewise, and Jacob finished his life in exile in Egypt. And in many ways, the description of the, these patriarchs' lives would be anything but ideal. If you, if you explained this to someone who knew nothing about the Bible, that this is how people lived and this is what they do, did because God said to them, can you, can you imagine what response you might get? What, they, they, they left everything that they had to go to the, the, this, this land which God promised them, but actually they didn't receive any of it. They didn't own any of it, and they wandered around for all these years, going from place to place, and Abraham did this with his elderly wife, and then eventually a young son, and didn't get anything. It's madness. What a letdown. But similar arguments could be made about Christians in this life, and it is in some, in some cases, isn't it? Perhaps those who are persecuted for following Jesus Christ, as we know that they are in, in many places in the world. 
those who suffer terrible illnesses or terrible losses in their lives or people who struggle throughout their lives to have and, and maintain jobs or to provide for their families or you know, who do not have much but are still faithful Christians. And people wonder why they may dedicate themselves to this God when it's seemingly they're suffering, they're not actually receiving many blessings, and they live these careful and godly lives rather than carefree lives. But the reason for this is actually straightforward. And if you don't know this morning, because, because, because maybe you have not dedicated yourself to Jesus Christ, and you may be curious about what all this is about then the reason is straightforward. That like Abraham, Sarah, Isaac and Jacob and millions and millions of other Christians throughout the generations and across the globe is that Christians aren't focused on this life only. We look beyond this life. We look to the heavenly The Apostle Paul tells us to set our minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Our Lord Jesus Christ teaches us. He says, don't set up, don't lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal. But instead, put your treasure in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy nor thieves break in and steal. These things are eternal. And to some measure, anyone can understand this, can't we? Clothes get old. Cars rust and break down. Homes, if they're not uh, kept up, are dilapidated. And ultimately, and this of course is the big thing, ultimately we all die and at death we can't take anything with us. I mean, you think of the pharaohs who were buried, you know, thousands of years ago they were buried sometimes with their servants who were Uh, and buried with many treasures to take with them on the journey in the next life. And what happened when thousands of years later archaeologists come? The bodies are still there. The money's still there. You can't take anything with you. And the point here is the patriarchs laid up for themselves treasure in heaven. They were not so concerned with inheriting the physical land of promise as much as they were focused on inheriting that city whose builder and maker is God. In this respect, when they died, they didn't regret life's journey. Abraham didn't regret leaving the year of the Chaldeans. The writer makes the point he could have gone back if he wanted to. He just had to retrace his steps back to Ur. He could have done that if he, he wanted to, but... That would be to say that his, his, his focus, his life, his perspective was based on the things of the present physical age. But instead what we have is no regrets. No regrets for the hundred years of wandering. No regrets for living in a tent for all these years. Neither did Isaac nor Jacob. Why? Because they were focused entirely on the promises of God. That God would do what he promised. Their descendants would inherit the land of Canaan. But more importantly, those patriarchs would inherit the eternal kingdom. And that's how they died. They died in faith. They died with their eyes fixed on the promise that would be theirs because they believed that the seed of Abraham would come and destroy the works of the devil. The seed of Abraham would come through whom all the nations of the earth would be blessed. In that sense, we, that's how we understand. Abraham rejoiced to see my days, Christ said. He saw it and was glad because he saw it with the eye of faith through the promises that God had made. Jesus would come and bring all these things to pass. In that sense, the, as the hymn says, death is naught but a step to thine eternity. So they look to the promises of God. So our author writes, these all died in faith, not having received what was promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar. That's what the eye of faith is. Faith sees the heavenly. God shows us by faith what it is, what is to come through his word by the power of the Holy Spirit. As one commentator writes, he says, Christians are presently filled with joy because of the certainty of what lies ahead. By faith, we greet and enjoy the things promised in the life to come. In that sense, as Christians, we can be certain of what is to come because God has promised. 
If you believe this morning, God has made a promise to you that there is a place in His eternal kingdom for you. You know, when Jesus said that I go away, when He said to His disciples in the Last Supper, I go away to, to, to make a place for you in heaven. That promise is to you this morning. Jesus has made a place for you in heaven. If you believe this morning, it's already yours. You don't have to go and get it. You don't have to go and pay for it. It's been paid for. We sung the hymn earlier, didn't we? We spoke about the blood of Christ that's been shed for us, a Calvary that washes us and cleanses us from our sin. That's the price that's been paid. And by God's grace and His Holy Spirit, He's given you faith in the efficacy of Christ's sacrifice. It's effective for you, by which now you are able to enter into heaven and take hold of that place. By faith, we, we, we see this. I mean, you think of someone like the Apostle Paul. Man, it, you know, if, if someone had such an awful life, do you think, why on earth are you a Christian, mate? You know, you look, at, you look at what he speaks about in 2 Corinthians, the whole list of sufferings. And when he gets to the end of the list of sufferings, he speaks about, above all these things, my anxiety for the churches, which is why I'm praying and praying all the time. You think, if, if that man had lived for Christ and it was for this life only, you think you should have given up right at the beginning. And yet what, Christ, what, what Paul says you know, in, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, when he speaks about the very fact that he's a, a preacher, he speaks about the gospel, he says, for which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and teacher, which is why I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know whom I believed, and I'm convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. And then a few chapters later, in the same epistle, he writes this, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure has come. I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, and this is for us, isn't it? But to all those who have loved his appearing. There's a crown of righteousness that's held out to us of, that is infinitely valuable. And that's how Paul looked at death. That's how he looked at the sufferings of this life. And this is the, the amazing things he writes, isn't it? Because, you know, as, as Sam said, I might not know the, all the circumstances of your life, but God does. But Paul, I think, helps us whether we suffer with illnesses or whether we suffer with great grief, isn't it? He, he, he sets up the perspective we ought to have as Christians that this suffering is a slight momentary affliction when compared with the eternal weight of glory that belongs to us. That's the perspective. And Paul's not saying that suffering is easy. Suffering by the very uh, definition of the word is hard. And we're going to go through it. If we're human, we're going to suffer. But Paul sets the finiteness and the shortness of this life and our experiences against the glory that Christ has won for us. And he says, even after all those sufferings, this is my perspective because that's the faith that's been given to me. And that's what's been won for me by my Savior. And that's a wonderful thing so that he knew that when he closed his eyes on earth, even though he may have been beheaded by Nero, he knew that at that moment when his eyes closed, he would be translated to glory. To behold the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And that's what God has promised us. And has been guaranteed for us through Christ's work for us and the Holy Spirit's work in us. It's ours. You know, the Westminster Shorter Catechism, question 37. The answer says, The souls of believers are at their death made perfect in holiness and do immediately pass into glory. And their bodies still united to Christ to rest in their graves till their resurrection. This in many ways it helps us to understand why the, why the writers of Scripture, oftentimes when they speak of the saints dying, they use the term fell asleep. It's interesting, when Stephen is martyred, it says, you know, he fell asleep. Because the expectation is that he will wake. 
And he will wake on that resurrection day, won't he? As the soul united to the body, but at that point he's gone to be with Christ. And that's the glory of what, that's the, that's the glory of what we believe. But in order to die well, we also have to live well. And in that sense, we, 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 we're being shown, not just in this chapter 11, thinking of the saints of, of old, like Abraham, but through the, through the, the Old Testament record, of how these people lived by faith. So verse 14 to 16, for people who speak thus make it clear that they're seeking a homeland. If they'd been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. It's interesting, isn't it? They're called aliens and exiles or sojourners. And it's, it says more really about their life as pilgrims, as wanderers, as, as, as people who never really took hold of the, for, of the land of Canaan, the promised land. In Genesis 23, we, we're told about the death of Sarah uh, in the land of Canaan, in the land of promise. And Abraham wants to bury Sarah. He introduces himself to the Hittites like this. I am a sojourner and foreigner among you. Give me property among you for a burying place and I may bury my dead out of my sight. What he's literally saying is, I'm an alien and a pilgrim. That's what I am. I don't, it's almost like I don't belong in your land. I'm someone who's passing through. Someone without a home. And yet we know that, this, that Abraham was called out of her to receive this land. But, to li- but he lived there as an alien and a stranger. But in many ways, in Abraham's life, we're being taught about what we are. Because we're actually called out of this world to answer God's call. And, and, and through life's journey, and through life, journey towards the promised land. As a Christian, then, we are aliens and exiles in the world. Now, I, I'm a proud Welshman. And I'm sure there's lots of proud Welshmen and Welsh women here this morning, perhaps some English men and women as well, the people from other nations. And often we, we, we're proud of, of where we hail from, particularly at the Six Nations. But ultimately, that's not how we identify ourselves. If we belong to Jesus Christ, then we're Christians. And if we're Christians, then we're pilgrims. Even though we may have homes in Wales, actually neither Wales nor anywhere else in the world is actually our home. We're aliens and exiles. Why? Because we're not citizens of this world, we're citizens of heaven. Abraham was commended for his faith because he never turned back, even though he lived as a pilgrim, as a sojourner, dwelt in tents for all these years. But he never seemed to regret that decision. He never thought, oh, I want to go back to her with the cities and the comforts and, the, and everything it had to offer. See, in contrast, then Lot's wife looked back, didn't she, longingly at Sodom and Gomorrah of all places. And God judged her for it. The Israelites in the wilderness so often complained about the hardships of their journey and longed to go back to Egypt because of the earthly pleasures that they enjoyed there, the food that they could eat. That despite being slaves, they could say, well, we lack for nothing. You know, we didn't have to worry about water. We didn't have to worry about food on our plates. But that's the attitude that clings to the things of this life. The stuff that many may consider to be important today, of course, is wealth. Material things. Like houses, cars, designer clothes. Perhaps it's status in jobs, power, authority. Perhaps it's popularity. Especially with the explosion of social media, isn't it? How many followers have I got on TikTok and Instagram and everything else? Is that what's important? In the end, if our treasure is here, if that's what our perspective is, if that's what our focus is, to make our treasure here, then like Lot's wife, like the Israelites, we'll long for that stuff and it leads to nothing except sorrow, death, and judgment. But instead, we're to be like Abraham, who left his home, who left his kindred, his family, and he left everything to go to the land that God would show him. You know, when our Lord called the first disciples, 
the language that is used is, is reminiscent of that with Abraham, isn't it? We're told Peter, James, and John left everything to follow Christ. They left everything to follow Christ. And that's the disciples' disposition. Leaving the worldly to journey toward the heavenly. Of course, that doesn't mean that we don't need jobs. Of course, it's preferable to have a place to live and uh, it's important to have clothes on our back and food on our tables. We have to live well and live for God's glory. But the point is, like Abraham, we don't put our trust in these things. As Psalm 63 tells us, we trust in God alone. So Jesus Christ is the first thing in our lives. He's our focus. You know, thinking about food, drink and clothing, what does our Lord Jesus say? Don't worry about these things. Don't be anxious about these things. What you shall eat, what you shall drink, and what you shall wear. Instead, seek God's kingdom and His righteousness. And because God loves you and cares for you, these things will be yours as well. In fact, he says, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Because you know His cross led Him to paradise. The next chapter in Hebrews, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame. And what's happened to him? He's now seated at the right hand of God. And that joy belongs to all those who trust fully in him for their salvation. So in that sense then, we accept that we're aliens and exiles here because actually our our home is in heaven. So like Abraham, we identify ourselves as such, as people who are seeking a home, who are on this journey to the city whose builder and maker is God. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul speaks about these things. And he speaks about us being, you know, the, the Gentiles, particularly becoming citizens of heaven. He says, therefore remember that one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So what then? So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. That is what has happened. We're not strangers and exiles from God's household and His kingdom. Instead, now, because of Jesus Christ and by the power of the Spirit, we're brought in. We're children of God. And we're heirs of the promises that He has made. So we're fellow citizens with the saints like Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Abel, Noah, Enoch, and everyone else. Now in the second century, a letter was written, the epistle to Diognetus. It was an apologetic for Christians and Christianity. It's well worth a read. You can can pick it up on the internet. They say in it we read, Christians dwell in their own countries, but only the sojourners. Every foreign country is a homeland to them, and every homeland is foreign. The existence is on earth but their citizenship is in heaven. That's what it was for Abraham. He sought this heavenly home because by faith he believed that his citizenship was not actually in the promised land of Canaan, which his descendants would inherit, but in heaven. And so with this perspective, we see how he lived and how he was able to live by faith. God blessed Abraham immeasurably on earth. But that was nothing compared to what he would inherit in the kingdom of heaven. And that's what belongs to all who believe. It is your inheritance. Peter says as much, doesn't he? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by faith are being guarded uh, for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. That's wonderful, isn't it? That's what is yours, an inheritance that is yours today. Guarded, kept for you by God, 
and being guarded by the faith that He's given to you. And it will be revealed in the last time. And we live with this faith perspective. And we journey through this life then as Christ's disciples. We have to be salt and light in the world, don't we? Contributing to society, showing people what it means to be Christians, we're to go into all the nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that Christ has commanded us, in the confidence that Christ is with us. We're to live lives of service, but we do so with this heavenward perspective. We're journeying through life to our eternal home. And when we die, as Abraham, Sarah, and others, with this perspective, with this living faith in our hearts and minds, then death doesn't become a tragedy. Though we will grieve, those who are left will grieve, but we do not do as others do without hope. We grieve with hope. Because we know that our loved ones are now in a better place than we are. My grandmother, I know she's with Christ. Enjoying the promised peace and joy and just waiting for Christ to return. And our loved ones' bodies are resting, still united to their Savior, being prepared for their glorious resurrection. That's the faith that's ours. That's the reality that belongs to you this morning, if you believe. And it's altogether wonderful and glorious. We understand the Apostle Paul's dilemma then, don't we? When, he, when in Philippians he's saying, oh, so do I stay? Or do I go to be with Christ? One is better for you, but the other is better for me. But there's just one other side to this, and just mention this before I finish. If you don't believe this morning, then it means that your home is here on earth. Everything you cherish, everything in which you place your hope is here on earth, and the reality is it will come to a crashing end. And when Christ returns, all that's left is the judgment. And cast him out. So I'd urge you this morning, come to Jesus Christ. Trust in him for your salvation. Because when you do, not only is your life transformed now, but you also begin your journey that will end in eternal life, an eternity of joy and peace where you'll be with every one of God's children from across history and across the globe. And you'll join in the kingdom of heaven on that glorious day. New Jerusalem, as we see in Revelation, at the end of Revelation, coming down from heaven and that glorious city of peace and joy where we'll see Jesus Christ face to face and we'll be able to worship him for everything that he is and everything that he has done for us and dwell forever where all the pain and suffering and grief of this life will be gone. That's a wonderful promise, isn't it? So for us who believe, it lifts up our hearts, doesn't it, this morning? And gives us that longing for our heavenly home. But it's also a call. If you don't believe this morning, come to him. Because what he promises you is greater than anything and everything that you can receive in this life. Amen.